you good afternoon greetings from Massachusetts where it's already Friday afternoon. And um, we've been doing this quite a bit. We've had a lot of publicity for this project called Hands Across the Hills. And we do a great deal of Zoom speaking, which is quite nice. It's one of the good things that's come out of the awfulness of the pandemic because we can speak to you without trips to California. As nice as that would be, it would be a little impractical for 90 minutes. So the agenda today is um, Ben and I are going to um, be speaking in the form of a dialogue. So we're gonna be modeling what it is that we do in our work and we will ask each other questions of curiosity and interest and respond to them. And then after we've had three rounds of that, we're gonna show you a 10 minute video clip that was taken in one of our uh, dialogue programs. And following that, we wanna open it up for discussion and Q and A. So we'll be able to answer lots of questions because we'll have a good amount of time. Um, for a background, because you're Californians, a little bit about um, our two states, uh, Massachusetts and Kentucky, you may know, of course, that Massachusetts is one of the most liberal states in the country, and Kentucky is a very conservative state politically. And in fact, the, um, the project was started um, by towns and counties, and as we get into that, we'll talk about the differences in our towns and counties. And and um, we'll also talk about what happened in the process. You'll see a little bit of dialogue and how we've been changed by it. And yet at the same time, what's fascinating is Kentucky has a long, long, long history of multiracial labor organizing and Massachusetts also has a long history of slavery. Um, and that's one thing that we continue to discover is what are all of the complications that are underneath the labels. And so we're gonna, as Paula said, we're gonna do this in the form of a dialogue and a discussion as opposed to a kind of expositional presentation. So over the next half hour, I think a lot of the questions you might be having are gonna be answered in the course of the back and forth. Um, but if they're not, of course, feel free to keep them in mind. And then we're gonna, we really wanna have almost half of the time um, at the end for that discussion um, with you all. So there will be definitely um, time for that. So I'm going to kick this off. Um, so I'm going to ask a first question of Paula, and then she'll uh, answer, ask me back, and we'll go back and forth a little bit. So one thing that um, is true of this kind of work in general, when you're working with people from a different place, from a different background that do not share some of the same assumptions, some of the same mores, some of the same sense of what's obviously true and what's not, is that it's not easy, right? It's not comfortable. It's not um, you know, necessarily something that you do to relax um, and kick back on a Saturday night. So my question for you, Paula, is, you know, I know that there was huge interest in this project and being a part of it in Massachusetts, both when it started in uh, 2017 and then, excuse me, end of 2016 and 2017, and then into the present. L tell us more about what animates people there to what 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 uh, to to want to do this work, and in particular, thinking about the people that have been a part of Hands Across the Hills on the Massachusetts side. What um yeah, what animated them to do it? What are they hungry for? What are they what 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 are they looking to get out of it? Well, people were going along, minding their own business, and doing pretty well in their lives, and then the 2016 election happened. And suddenly people were not going about minding their own business. They were in a state of very high anxiety about the outcome of the 2016 election and a great deal of agitation and fear and worry and, um, and mystery arose about what was gonna happen and they wanted to know more. So the birth story of Hands Across the Hills is um, we, we live in a small town in Western Massachusetts. It's not anything like Boston. We're two hours directly west of Boston and we're in a rural area. So I'm looking out my window at a forest full of big, big Eastern East Coast trees and still little bits of snow. And 
um, most people in Leverett, the little town outside of Amherst, Massachusetts, live this way quite rurally. So we got together after the election. We called a meeting. Um, myself and a few others had a little group called a peace committee. And we called a meeting in our town library and uh, invited people to come and talk about the election. And about 60 people showed up, which is large for a small town. And we decided to break into various interest groups. One of the interest groups was wanting to talk to people who had voted for Trump to understand their background, their motivation, their, their enthusiasm for him, and for us to share our concerns. And we assumed we would do that with people in neighboring towns. Our town voted 85% for Hillary. So there wasn't much juice for opposition in our town, but there are lots of towns around us that, that voted for Trump. And we thought we would find one. And so we went about talking to ministers and social workers and activists in the towns, and we didn't find anybody because it was so raw after the election and people, I think, were just afraid that a bunch of liberal uh, do-gooders were gonna bang them on the head and make them feel awful so and blame so they didn't want to talk to us so our project was sort of this nascent idea that went dormant and then one of our members found an article online that ben had written and that triggered off an initial conversation that resulted in our partnership and ben's question was what did what did people want i think people wanted wanted reassurance that things were going to be okay um, after this election that would not be the, the end of the world and the end of the democracy. And they wanted to be actively engaged. This is a, this is a politically active hotspot of the country. And most of the people that joined Hands Across the Hills, which was by voluntary choice, of, of course, um, did so because of their commitment to social change. What we learned early on was that the only person you can change is yourself and you can't change others. But that, that takes some learning for all of us because our first instinct is to want to change others. So Ben will tell you about what happens um, when he got an email from one of our members, which picks up the story on his end and how we formed a group. Yeah, so the, the question, so, so first of all, just, just a little bit about me, so I, have li I lived in East Kentucky for several years, actually moved down there um, shortly, about a year before the 2016 election. And I'll, if, if that, actually that article that I just sent that, um, that Jay and Massachusetts First Sound tells a little bit of the story of me and how I got there and the work I was doing there. So I won't, uh, I won't bore you with that whole story now. But what I'll say is I'm clearly, you know, as I said to people in East Kentucky, you hear my accent, you see my nose, you know, I'm a communist Jew from the Northeast. So let's just put it right out there. I grew up in Connecticut, my family as New Yorkers, I've lived in places like Minnesota and Germany. And, um, but yeah, I came to Kentucky uh, because of mutual colleagues there um, that invited me there as part of a, a grassroots theater company with roots in the civil rights movement and the war on poverty. So. I was definitely somebody coming in from a different perspective. And that actually ended up being really helpful in starting the work down there because people have asked me, you know, because when, when, when people um, hear, oh, a dialogue between East Kentucky and Western Massachusetts, like, oh, the Western Mass people, like, why didn't they talk with people in their own backyard? Um, yeah. And as Paula just said, well, they tried. Um, and there, that was really hard. And so then they asked the next question is, well, why did they talk to you? Um, or rather more to the point, why did the people you're working with in Kentucky talk with them? And at least part of that answer is because we had spent the past year doing this work, talking with people and working with people who we otherwise don't talk and work with. First of all, of course, a lot of community leaders have been talking with me. And why do they talk with me? Not because they're particularly interested in intercultural dialogue with a communist Jew from the Northeast, but because that communist Jew from the Northeast was coming in with some grant money, frankly. 
um, and there was the chance to work together on stuff that they had long cared about, on the square dance that that community center on the top of a mountain wanted to revive, the bluegrass festival that that volunteer fire department in a really remote area of the county wanted to start, the catering company that some people coming out of imprisonment and used to dealing drugs in a coal camp wanted to start, these, these ideas that had been pipe dreams and we were able to raise some money to work to, to, to start to make them real. But to make them real, we had to work together. And working together meant working with people even within this one county in the East Kentucky coal fields. Because um, within that county, there were divisions going back generations in terms of class, in terms of religion, in terms of whose family did what to the other family. You know, we border Pike County on the north side where the Hatfields and the McCoys were from. Like this stuff is real. So when we talk about working across divides, it's easy to say we're just talking about, you know, Democrat and Republican or North and South or black and white or whatever it is. But divides go on every level. It's, it, 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 it's all the way down. And so one thing that people that I'd work with in Kentucky um, can say is that they'd been doing this work for a year already. Um, and so when this letter came from Massachusetts, um, there was a lot of difficult, hard, complicated feelings, and a lot of feelings of what are these people after? You know, are they just wanting to come down and, you know, point at us and and you know which is and and you know stick cameras in our face and ask us why ask us why we're so stupid because there's a long 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 history of that certainly in places like east kentucky also in places that have experienced intergenerational poverty in lots of places in the country and so there was there was a lot of that to work through it was seven months of working through that before we all met for the first time but they were primed to the idea that talking with people who they hadn't talked with and that they'd maybe seen as the enemy was maybe gonna get them somewhere um, that they could not imagine yet in that place because that's what we've been doing together over the last year. And so that's what prompted the curiosity for them to write back to that email at all. Um, and then we had a series of conversations and we wrote back and I encouraged them to write back with every single one of the things that they were most offended by. And you know what they agreed was, well, if the people in Massachusetts can take it and they still wanna talk with us, then we're starting at a good place. And the last thing I'll say, because I think this is important, is one of the asks that they had, um, that Nell and Val um, and Carol, the people that I worked with in Kentucky who were on those initial conversations, they said, we wanna go up to Massachusetts first. We don't want a bunch of people in Massachusetts coming down to coal country, having no idea what's going on and just kind of as, as tourists. We wanna go up there first. We wanna see where you live. We wanna build relationships with you. And then we can invite you down here as friends, as colleagues, as people that we already know. And that's what happened. And I think it worked really well. Um, so we can pick up that story right there. Um, been seen a couple of questions in the chat about the methodology that we used. And what I will say is I am a Johnny come lately to dialogue. My background is in critical pedagogy and organizing and um, and grassroots theater. And so I can talk about you know that stuff in a bit. But Paula is obviously one of the world experts in dialogue as a formal methodology. And so the question that I want to ask you picking up on the story and picking up on what's in the chat is, How'd you think about putting this together as the facilitator, especially of that first weekend? We came up to Massachusetts, October 2017, less than a year after the election. We had three days together. Um, how'd you think about structuring that time? What methods did you use? Um, how did you adapt them, apply them? And what, were, what was the thought process behind it? Well, um, fortunately, I've had a lot of background in this. Uh, Karuna Center for Peace Building, the organization I started back in the early 90s, um, works in international conflicts. And we generally go in after a war and work with divided communities where in many cases, the family, the, the community of one side has killed members of the other side. 
maybe not people right in the room, but people in their towns and certainly in their in their identity groups. And um, our first big project was Bosnia, which was profoundly divided, you know. And uh, we worked in um, India and Sri Lanka and Myanmar, formerly Burma. We worked in Rwanda right after the genocide there, in Macedonia and Kosovo and in South Sudan and all kinds of countries all over the world with very, very violent conflict. But after the war, there were always those people who rise up like the phoenixes and say, how do we put Humpty Dumpty together again? How do we live in this city or this village after mass conflict? When there are mass graves all around us, how do we relate to those people who have killed our families? So I was used to tough dialogue. <laughs> Um, and I also have done racial dialogues and cross-religious dialogues and other things in the United States. So I took my ideas on how to frame this from my experiences around the world. Most dialogues in the US are done in a very short form, sometimes a few hours, sometimes a full day. Um, my personal interest is in transformative dialogue. And because I had all this experience, the group from Massachusetts asked me to be the organizer and facilitator. And transformative dialogue takes time because the heart and mind don't shift easily. They shift over periods of repeated exposure and intimacy and honesty together. So I wanted to create a long frame of time together. And when I, when I worked um, in the United States with international students, I brought them for three weeks we really plunged in. I would bring 60 students twice a year from war zones, put them in one big room and for three weeks we worked together and everybody was transformed. Um, I knew I couldn't get three weeks or even one week, but we negotiated three days. And that meant that the, the traveling party would arrive on a Thursday and leave on a Monday. So we had solid three days in the middle. And I also did not want to use hotels. I wanted to use homestays. There was a reason for that. Um, there's nothing more intimate than having breakfast at someone's kitchen table in your bathrobe and meeting their family and hanging out together in the evening after a long day at, at, the, uh, at the dialogue circles and maybe having a glass of wine and talking more. Um, so I wanted that intimacy. So everybody from Kentucky, when they arrived in Massachusetts, was given a very hearty welcome from a homestay host. And when we went to Kentucky, we had homestay hosts there and we've gone back and forth. They've been here twice and we've been to Kentucky once. Our second trip to Kentucky was aborted due to COVID and will take place when we're all COVID free and dare to enter other people's homes again, which we hope is not in the very distant future. So, I also knew that people can't sit in a circle all day and just talk to each other. First of all, you'd be brain dead, drained. But second of all, not everybody learns from verbal exchange. We're not all equally gifted verbally. Some people learn from art, music, dance, drama, potluck sharings, going out for walks in the fall foliage, many different kinds of ways we learn. So I structured the three days so that every day there were two dialogue circles of two and a half to three hours each and lots of time in between morning, afternoon and evening for informal learning, which is part of the bonding process. So we did that and also with the dialogues, which were new to most people, um, I always begin dialogues with creating a set of guidelines or ground rules, which creates kind of a container. I'm using my hands to show this kind of a holding environment to help people feel safe. Safety and confidentiality are very big issues in dialogue, as is the building of trust and the testing of trust. So we work very hard on holding those guidelines of how to speak, how to listen. I also in dialogue teach people how to ask questions because although we think we know how to ask questions, most of our questions are quite negative, often with a little dagger in them. Overseas it was, why did you start the war? That's not a question, it's a clobbering on the head, it's an accusation, it's a blame. So we taught people 
since we were talking about very delicate political and social issues, we taught people how to ask questions and how to listen without countering back with an argument. So we worked very hard on creating an environment where good listening and opening the heart could occur, and it occurred very deeply. We went, we went very far with this group in our first three days, and that has deepened each time. And now that we're in the Zoom world, we Zoom every month. But because the group knows each other so well, we're able to manage on Zoom. So that's, that's what I did to, um, to organize ourselves and facilitate our dialogues. And I think it worked pretty well. Just to say, by way of ending, we called ourselves Hands Across the Hills because we both live in the hills. And we originally were sort of hands across the divides and Ben gave us feedback on that, that, that emphasizes the divides and hands across the hills is much more welcoming and spacious. So that's what we chose. So that's what I did. And Ben, as he said, was new to this process, but Ben has done storytelling and social organizing in circles for a long time. He's got his own methods and he uses them. And um, he's gonna talk a little bit about how all his work applies to our process and what it was like for him. Yeah, so just to, to pick up on what Paula said last and then I'll go into the method stuff. You know, one of coming, cu coming at this work as an organizer and obviously in organizing, which is about building power, right? It's about people coming together you know, as Paula was talking about, about communities in Bosnia and Myanmar and other places she's worked, they are divided communities. And divided, it is very important we understand, not as an adjective, not as something that is just true and existentially just, you know, incontrovertible, uh, incontrovertible but rather not as an adjective, but as a participle. We are not divided, we have been divided by forces that are not us, and that do not mean us well, whether we're talking about any kind of divide that we're talking about. And so the work of organizing, um, and there's obviously a lot of overlap here, it's about recognizing the ways we have been divided to make us more conquerable, overcoming those divides by building power together and then using that power to organize people, money, and ideas to make palpable changes in the circumstances that we share, in the neighborhoods we live in, in the towns, in the county, and then eventually at, at, at broader scale as we, big, as we build bigger and bigger coalitions and alliances. So on the way there, of course, a lot of conversation happens, a lot of difficult topics get discussed. And so the difference to Jim's question between conversation and dialogue is really just terms of art. So Paula has a very particular way of doing this coming out of these kind of conflict situations that she's worked. I've got a particular way of doing it in terms of these particular organizing projects that I've worked, um, that I've worked in. And one of the central tenets of the approach to organizing that I practice, um, which comes out of the civil rights tradition um, and one reading of the Alinsky tradition, roots in the popular front, the CIO, all the way back to the Farmers Alliances and the People's Party of the late 19th century. One central tenet of that tradition is that no two human beings on God's green earth have ever come together based on what they don't have in common. That we always start from what we share, which doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to the things that are different between us and the ways that we have been divided, but we don't let those things define us. We start based on what we share, even if the only thing we share is that we are human beings, we have families, we're from someplace, we do work that we care about. We live in places we care about. There are people we care about, and we're probably somewhat curious about the about people that are not like us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this kind of project. Even if we have no idea what we have in common other than that, that is a ton to work from. So when we were having these discussions, um, you know, within the Letcher County Culture Hub in East Kentucky about, you know, are we going to do this project? Blah blah blah. 
Um, there's actually a woman in East Kentucky in Letcher County who's from Massachusetts, from the Boston area. She's an old organizer. She's great. Um, and she's been living in Letcher County for like 20 years. Um, and she was at this meeting and she said, well, you know, Western Massachusetts, that's like, you know, people in Boston, they kind of like make fun of people there. It's kind of hillbillies too. And that's where we got this idea. It is called not hands across the divides, but hands across the hills. Um, in that way. So that's the kind of work that we started. So again, the, the work in Kentucky locally was about, all right, how do we collectively make that bluegrass concert, make that square dance, make that business, make that solar energy project, et cetera. And coming out of that, the ways that we learned to identify what matters to all of us, what we all value, we brought that into the process of hands across the hills. So the, the most kind of concrete methodology, um, and this comes right out of civil rights organizing and the tradition of roadside theater, is what's called the story circle, which is as, just as a, as a dialogue um, is that Paula was talking about. It's formal, it's structured, it starts with a prompt. Tell a personal story. This is an actual prompt that we use. So we got to a certain point in the dialogue the third time we were together. So this is October, 2019 up in Leverett again. And we had gotten to this point where we'd sort of reached an impasse in the dialogue. There were a lot of big issues that were out there. We talked about, we'd sort of broached a lot of the tough stuff, but it was like, okay, we recognize we agree on some things, we disagree on some things. It's like, okay, clearly that's the case among any people, but how do we get deeper than that? So we did a story circle and the prompt was tell a person, which we agreed on together as a group, Tell a personal story about a moment that in your life that had a serious effect on the way you participate in society. And after I said that prompt, we were all quiet for a while and people just thought and people just considered. It was, you know, um, and at one point somebody broke the silence and then we went around just around that circle. People, people could pass if they wanted to. And we came back to them. And what's distinctive about a story circle is the stories that people tell are in response. They you know you start with the prompt, but what you're really responding to after the prompt is the stories that you heard before you. And so you tell a story that contributes to what we call the story in the middle of the circle. And what ended up happening in that story circle, which was a total surprise to me, and I imagine to you too, Paula, but you can uh, speak for yourself, is we found out that in a way that had nothing to do with who was from Kentucky or who was from Massachusetts, lots of us, not, this is not true of my own story, but lots of people from both groups had pretty intense histories of family violence that shaped them in all sorts of ways. And coming out of that, you know, there's no crosstalk during the story circle, but once everybody shares, we all take a moment and then reflect on what happened. We just talk about how many of us have similar experiences from different perspectives that really shape us in ways that absolutely cannot be reduced to, you're on one side of this issue, I'm on the other side of this issue. So, that's a little bit about and uh, about how you know my side of things methodologically. Building on that question of what we learned about each other, the story, kind of the last question I wanted to explore, and I'll ask it to Paula first, is thinking about we've now spent more than three years together. How have you been transformed? And how have you witnessed other people being transformed, recognizing that the point of this isn't to change anybody else, but to be open to the change that happens in yourself. How has that experience been for, for you? And how have you experienced it, Paula, with, with you know, your friends, neighbors, colleagues? Well, thanks, Ben. I would say for me that it's been a profound transformation. And I'll talk about that probably more so than I expected. Somebody asked about the difference between dialogue and conversation. They're very different. Dialogue is structured, it's facilitated, and it's boundaried. 
It's not anything like a casual conversation. And it's on specific topics that the facilitator develops in order to build relationships and trust and understanding and sensitivity between group members. So in the beginning, people often ask, well, how did you get started with this? What, do you, what did you do for your first days? And um, I, I saw it, well, I've got a three day frame. And the first day we have to get to know each other. We're absolute strangers. The third day we have to say goodbye to each other and reflect on our learnings. The middle day was a day we could talk about Trump and all the hot button social issues that accompanied that election. So that's the way I structured the three days in my mind. And I thought, as Ben said, the first day is to build common ground because you never build a relationship based on what you don't have in common. It's like having a first date. If you have a first date and you find all your differences, you never have a second date. So the first date has to be to find, find your common ground. And I thought, well, we all have family stories in common. So let's start with family stories. And I also was very concerned about people's anxiety starting to talk right away. So I brought in an artist friend and she set out a whole array of kindergarten supplies. We had pens and crayons and markers and glitter and string and colored paper and all sorts of things. And we were each asked to make a square, a quilt square sized piece of paper that she gave us with a family story. Some people did present tense, some did past tense, some did ancient history, didn't matter, it was theirs. But that gave us a chance before we began to plunge into dialogue to be side by side with all these papers spread out in a whole room and play together. And then she took the squares and mounted them on a quilt backing so that we had a quilt showing our togetherness, which was a wonderful start. And then we heard from everybody about their family stories. And as Ben said, a lot of violence, a lot of tragedy, and a lot of common ground. And then as we talked more over the days, we said, oh, we all want the same thing. We're not so different. We want education for our kids. We want healthcare for our families. We want um, subsistence subsidies for our retirements. We want clean water and air and land. These are all things we have in common. And it didn't take too long before we said, well, here's another insight. A person is larger than their vote. And we need to remember that in this country because we're so partisan now and so polarized. But a person is a, a complex organism of a lifetime of input, of family, of history, of hopes and hopes dashed, of politics, of media of economics, of education, all of that determine a vote. It doesn't come out of the sky. It comes out of a great deal of lived experience, but a vote is not a whole person. And we discovered and I discovered that despite the fact that we have very different feelings about political situation and voting choices and um, critical social issues like immigration and abortion and guns and um, gay marriage and all the big social issues that are up for us in our own era. Um, despite those differences, we were bonded with each other. And for me, that bonding has meant a deep care for each of the participants from Kentucky. And even more importantly, a deep care for other people who are not in my circle, who are from Kentucky or from California or from Alabama or from North Carolina, wherever they're from in the country, care for their stories and their interests. And it, it keeps me from the blame that I wanna get into um, for people voting in a way that I felt was so dangerous for the country and it, keeps me, it keeps me reminding other people, there is a story there, look for the story. Don't see the person as a cardboard stereotype, Trump voter or Biden voter or Hillary voter, look for the backstory and see what's there and find out who this person is at a much deeper level.
And in some cases, you will find a great deal of common grounds and a great deal of compassion arising in your heart. So I, I'm very connected now with um, speaking to people who don't think like I do and don't vote like I do, but I need to understand them and not blame them. And they need to understand me and they need to drop their cardboard stereotypes of me at the same time. So I have felt it very profound. And just like being overseas in Bosnia or Burma or Rwanda and getting to know people there has opened my heart to their situations um, and I care about them. The same thing has happened with Kentucky. That's opened my heart to people there and I care deeply about them and about their future and about other people's future who are falling between the cracks in our country. So that's what's happened to me and I'm grateful for it. And I'm grateful that we're continuing because no matter how deep we go as in any relationship there's always deeper, always another level of learning and understanding and personal transformation. And I think Ben has been on a similar journey, a different journey because he's been living in Kentucky and he comes from New England. So he's already got both those cultures in him but he's also been on a learning journey. And Ben, I'd love to hear how this has impacted you, given that you've already had so much experience. What's new here? What's added on in your own transformation and growth? Yeah, it's a really good question because honestly, in some sense, sort of the New England liberal world um, was what I was running away from, going to places like uh, Kentucky, and other places like that that I had worked and it kind of made me you know it's like I, I, I spent years in Kentucky kind of working sort of through sort of my stereotypes of people there and their stereotypes of uh, you know me and you know obviously you know we all made mistakes along the way but kind of came to understand each other then going back to Massachusetts, it was kind of rediscovering that for a long time and realized I'd sort of picked up some of the stereotypes of people there. Um, and, you know, kind of because because what I discovered and, you know, wrote about in that in that article is that in some ways people in East Kentucky were more are more open minded than people in Western Massachusetts, which is, of course, not true of everybody either, but that I find, I do find, um, genuinely find that in a place in, in, in East Kentucky, I won't say a place like East Kentucky, in East Kentucky, I can have both personally and witness discussions among people who disagree politically in a much more open way. Um, and there is much less of a rush to moral judgment of a person um, who disagrees. And I wasn't prepared for that. I was not prepared for, you know, the Confederate flag waving guy, you know, who can talk with, you know, the environmentalist anarchist and they live on the same block and they're sometimes in the same family and they just, they just live together in a different way. And coming back to Massachusetts, it was like, wow, everybody, is kind of ideologically homogenous and um, you know, they've just never met anybody like that. And I immediately, it was easy for me to be judgy, right? Well, I got out and I figured it out. So why didn't they get out and figure it out? And it's like, the answer is I fell ass backwards into this. I got real lucky um, and I'm grateful to that. And I do a lot to make it possible for other people to have those experiences, um, which are not easy to have because we've been so divided um, and so polarized and people, it's, it's, you know, some people will self-righteously say, well, I don't know anyone that's like that. But I realize that a lot of people, even when it can sound self-righteous to me, it's like, no, I've never gotten a chance to meet anybody like that. And that's just like, that sucks. That sucks for them as much as for anybody. And so, coming at it with that, um, you know, with that understanding, it's like, well, yeah, of course you don't understand this. You've not experienced it. And it's really hard for any of us, myself certainly included, to understand things that we haven't experienced. Um, and so 
really coming to build an empathetic understanding. Like I knew I was going to have to build an empathetic understanding of East Kentuckians. I wouldn't have taken that up if I wasn't ready for that. But then going back to a place that felt a lot more like home was in some sense harder um, because it's sort of fighting some of my own demons. Um, and, you know, coming to, you know, what a lot of progressives will talk about as nonviolence, and a lot of conservatives will talk about as hating the sin, loving the sinner, which I really think are the same thing. Um, and doing that seriously, saying to people in East Kentucky, I hate that you voted for that candidate, that you display that flag, that you believe this way about that issue. I hate that. And I love you. And being able to say to somebody in Western Mass, I hate that you made that joke about people in Kentucky. I hate that you, you know, sort of are, 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 are in this bubble. And I absolutely love you um, and, 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 and want to build with you. Um, that was a big part of my journey. Um, and it's, it's, it's ongoing and it's continuing. And the last thing I, I'll say, and this echoes what Paula was saying about the informal moments of this, that just watching the people in East Kentucky and Western Massachusetts become such close friends with their hosts, ongoing, um, just years and years, just talking all the time informally and sharing things. And, and um, you know, just it, it, it's like, that's just been so cool. And I honestly, I was not expecting that. I was not expecting that we would still be this close with each other, you know, years later. I thought this would, that would be, this would be something that would be nice. We'd do it, it'd be what it is, and then it would be done. Um, but it is not done. Um, and it continues and it continues to grow. Yeah. It's kind of quite miraculous in a, in a sense, what's happened to us. We are, it is, it's bigger than we expected. It's also more visible than we expected. We have had superb publicity. It's a small, honestly, a small project, but there's such a need for hope in our country now across the polarizations that we've had all kinds of unexpected coverage. And that has kind of, I think, buoyed us up also and made us feel we're doing something really worthwhile. And for Ben and myself now, we it's kind of a teaching tool. This is an opportunity for us to speak to people like you and everybody's stuck around divisions, either in their family or their community or their workplace and to encourage reaching out and building. And we'll talk all about that in the Q&A, but first Ben's gonna introduce a video. Yeah, so before we open it up, we've been talking lots about this, but we wanted to make it possible for you all to see a little bit of it. So we're gonna show about an eight minute clip. Um, this is from the second time we were together. So we first uh, met in Massachusetts in October of 2017. And then this, what we were about to see is from the second uh, visit, which when, when the people in Massachusetts came to Kentucky in April of 2018. Um, and so we'd known each other for, you know, about six months at this point. Um, and this is from a short, um, this is from a short video and we can, the whole thing is on the website at handsacrossthehills.org. And so we, um, are going to show you just a little bit of it and you can by all means go and check out the whole thing on the site. I don't know how many people are in here voting for Trump, but I know I'm for him all the way. And that's what I want to hear, you know, I want to hear why. What am I missing? Because I think he's for the better good of the country. Well, First of all, where I live in the upper Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts, it's um, we often refer to it as a bubble. Um, it's protected. There's this invisible bubble that protects us from the outside world. And living in that bubble, I think, is also makes us, I think, feel superior to others. Why are these people so marginalized? Why are they in such desperate straits? What's happened to them? Talk about tears. I could I could cry a river over how hard the, that we have struggled. And it's not just me. It's been Nail. It's been Letha. It's been all of us. How hard Velda, for instance. I know how hard Velda lived. We did those kind of things. And I could cry a river over my hardships, but I'm above it. I'm above it. And what 
I'm afraid of is that I'm 76 years old and I'm not going to see the progress that you folks have seen from the letters. I'm going to miss that as a human being because I and was born in a place that is deprived and oppressed. It's a very good place to take a moment. Just to just take a moment and let's just let that sink. Let this just take a moment. We need a moment just to slow down a minute. His hands popping up fast. Thank you for that, Kendall. And Susan and everybody else. It's, I didn't come here to study you, and I don't think any of us did. We came here to experience Appalachia, and we are all richer for this experience that we've had. Just being with you, just sitting in your presence, watching you be with each other, how you are with me, um, I feel I know you, and I don't feel that I need to have questions about your opinions answered. I just am getting to know you more and more deeply. And I have not wanted to ask Velda anything. I'm getting to know she has opened her house to me. She feeds me in the morning. We drive around. I see her relating as she sees people she knows in the community. I feel I know her. You know, I'm really happy to know all of you all, and I'm really thankful for the conversation that Kip and I had, and it was a knockdown drag out, and I got pretty heated, I didn't pull a gun on him, but I didn't want to hit him. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, Kip, but I, maybe I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, but I was glad for that conversation. Because I think these conversations about class and about gun control and ab about all these controversial things are, are so valuable for us to have and to hear, hear the other side of the argument. Having hard conversations in a, in a, in a civil manner um, is a success in this country. And, and the, more, the more we can um evangelize if you will yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the basic civil discourse yeah. um irrespective of policy outcomes or preferences that, that when we can sit down and have a conversation um civilly that, that's huge and when we can do it and 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 get this close together emotionally that's just yeah. icing on the cake to me yeah it's wonderful thank you there's so much work political work that is not i will call it political work that is not activism that is not partisanship that is not pro or anti but is no less pointed and potentially powerful because of it we all need belonging and we all need self-development and sometimes they don't work in the same place at the same time and and so I, I learned a lot about that listening to you because in that way your lives are quite different from the lives of many of us in this circle in terms of where our parents are, where our children are, what we expect from our, our um, family and what we expect from our friendship network, which is a different kind of a family and building on that. Those are really important for me. It's this human heart that connects us and connects our longing and connects our sense of care for each other everywhere. So I relearned that with this group. I've met you people and I, I beginning to uh, respect you and care for you, each one of you. And I don't, I don't believe that if something happened to me in your presence, a bad thing or something that you wouldn't try to help. And that's what we're about. We try to help each other. That's what Americans do. We pull together. We might pull apart for a while, but when something really comes down to threaten us in a way that uh, 
you know, individually, we can't do anything about it. We will pull together. It is worth it. I mean, it is worth it. And we have built this over the last year where we are right now in our, our intimacy and our honesty. And um, yes, it's very much worth it. I can feel it in my heart. So hey, there we have it. So we can do this. However, there's a few things in the chat that I think we can, if uh, Michelle and Leslie, you want to um, give us uh, sort of take the temperature of the group, you could ask a couple things. And then if you got more questions, throw them in the chat, we'll take stuff from there. And then we'll, we can open it up to some live questions too. And Paula, thank you so much for taking your time and doing this. We really appreciate it. And by the number of participants, I think you can see the level of interest here. What I'm curious about is I have people in my family that are very different politically. Uh, so I know their family story to some extent, uh, but what I've really been wondering, and I did watch the uh, um, video you sent us recently uh, where you did talk some about the events of January 6th, mm -hmm. but given what's happened in the last couple of months, you know, the January 6th events, uh, the election, all the controversy about getting vaccinated and stuff, I'm really curious how the group is uh, addressing those issues. Um, and I know enough from seeing the, the most recent video that you sent that um, there's a lot of um, consensus that these are difficult topics, but my sense is that you have grown together by uh, finding a way, I'm sure because of the guidance that you help with the group when they talk, of dealing with these. But I'm really curious how that's been working because these are such intensely emotional issues um, as opposed to just points of view. And, and how's that work for the group? Well, it's, it's working very well and it's very hard. Um, these, are, these are hard conversations to have, but we don't want to avoid them because that's the point of our being together is not to avoid them. Um, the, we had a, a Zoom a few weeks ago and, and we've been talking about January 6th and the insurrection at the Capitol. We've been talking about Black Lives Matter. Um, we talked about Biden's inauguration. All of these things have been up. And one of the guys in our group is, you know, he's still a confirmed Trump supporter. Nothing has changed for him. And it's very hard to hear that. And my discipline and that of all the other group members is to learn to listen and not try to change him because that doesn't work. Trying to change somebody else is the last thing we can do. We all know that from our families and our relationships. We can only change ourselves and our attitudes toward them. So listening to that and, and looking for where the common ground is, and we found some. In his, our case, it was about Mitch McConnell, their senator. Um, and his friends about that. So that was our kind of common ground. Um, but, but we could generally find the common ground someplace with all of this. Um, we've addressed abortion and guns and immigration came up very early in our very first dialogue and has continued to come up. And, and I think people have learned a lot about who immigrants are and what their needs are and realizing their humanity and, and common ground with us also because of people in our group who have had migration experience in their families. So I would say that we're tackling each of these issues as best as we can and avoiding none. And last time we talked about the vaccination, one of the things that we've started is a, a writing project where we have the newspaper in Whitesburg, Kentucky and the newspaper in Western Massachusetts co-publishing columns that we wrote. And we've got one on vaccines. And uh, people in Kentucky are more suspicious and less inclined, not everybody, but many of them, and have different kind of histories. And people in Massachusetts, or many more of us are interested in having vaccines and relieved when we do. And that's a conversation that's going on, um, on the, in the column and also in our group. So all of these things are up for grabs. And I know that most families have divisions within them, polarizations, and it's not facilitated, it's a little harder. But the more you can train yourself to ask questions of curiosity and not blame and not try to change or argue, the better your family conversations can go. Yeah, let me just add, I'm just gonna add a couple things to that. First of all, right, we're no strangers to deeply emotionally charged stuff, right? That's where we started 
Um, I mean, it was emotionally charged from the beginning. I mean, literally, you know, people in Massachusetts felt that the election of Donald Trump was an existential threat to everything that was good in the world for good reason, I would argue. Um, and a lot, not, and a lot of people in Kentucky thought that voting for Donald Trump was the only thing that was going to keep the coal industry from collapsing, which is the only way that they've been able to feed their families for a hundred years. So it was just as existential on the other end. And so that's why, you know, so, I mean, we, we are, we are well primed to talk about these emotional, um, issues at this point, because there is that trust, there is that understanding we're able to laugh together too. That's the thing, and you saw a little bit of that in the in the video. And um, at the end today, by the way, I'm going to do a little commercial announcement for an opportunity to uh, see some of this um, live and in person soon. Um, but to be able to laugh and to be able to make fun of ourselves and each other a little bit has been really, really critical um, to this. Two more things I'll say. Um, one, I just um, to Susan to your point about um, holding people responsible. Of course. I don't love you know, some of my former neighbors in Kentucky because they voted for Trump. I just love them um, and absolutely hold them responsible. And they know what I think about, um, about their vote. Um, and they know, and we talk about the damage and we talk about it seriously. It's you know, to, to love people, to listen to people um, is, is not to say what they did was okay. I mean, Paul has worked with people who've committed genocide against other people's neighbors. That could, can never be okay. Um, but in the, in a funny way, and this is kind of a politically incorrect thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyway, you know, I think both Paula and I, and I think probably everybody in our groups are deeply ethically committed to the idea that we're not trying to evangelize or change anybody else or just listen to each other. But even if you weren't from a total Machiavellian perspective, if you want to change somebody, the best way to do that is to listen to them and validate them where they're at and not try to change them. That paradoxically, and there's more and more research showing this, that is the way people change, is when they are affirmed and listened to, because then they put their guard down and they're ready to listen back. One of the questions in the chat that I want to pay attention to is whether or not participants in our groups have shared their newfound understanding with family and friends. So it's not just myself and Ben doing this? And I would say the answer is yes. I think all of us have become proselytizers for dialogue in one way or another. And all of us can will speak and defend um, people from the other region and people like those people from the other region. And we encourage this a lot. We ask people to please talk to their communities and bring all of this home that none of it is um, made meant for us. It's meant for everybody. You know, I'm a public educator in the end, and I want I want to see people really taking this on. So I'm always encouraging that kind of that kind of sharing, so that everybody understands that we're in this not for ourselves but for others. And in Leverett, we had a public event both times the Kentuckians were here, with very large audiences and sometimes hundreds of people turning out who want to hear from the Kentuckians and learn from them and and very receptive, cheering them on and, and happy to have them here. When we went to Kentucky, it was harder for them to get a group together. I think next time might be easier, but I don't know that yet. Next time hasn't happened. Um, but there were still some people that we were able to talk to. And these things spread through families and ch church networks and school networks and other kinds of public places so that more and more people hear about what's going on. And it's important for them to hear it. Thank you, Dr. Green. Riding on the heels of what you just said, Kat had asked about how people find out about people, groups doing similar work near us. So she had mentioned National, National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, an organization locally that we might want to. Okay, so, so uh, what I wanna tell you is that since the 2016 election, hundreds of dialogue groups have, spread, have sprung up around the country, all over the place. And there are many organizations that you can find if you go to the Hands Across the Hills website and go to our resources page, you will see all kinds of places that are doing dialogue all over the country in all different styles and forms. 
um, National Council for Dialogue and Deliberation, I know well, I trained their director. She was my student and she learned dialogue from me and went on to form NCDD and become his first director. And her name is Sandy Heyerbacher. So that's what I know intimately. I know many of these organizations well. And uh, I was connected recently to an umbrella organization in the Midwest called Listen First. And they have 250 dialogue organizations on your website. So it's astounding how um, the, the need is felt so urgently in this country and it's spreading. Um, I've also been doing a uh, interracial dialogue in my community and some interreligious work. So though the many dialogues are happening all the time and um, it's not too hard. There's a lot going on in California, no doubt. And I'm sure you can find the resources by a little bit of research. Thank you. And one more question I just thought was worth asking about is, can you speak to scalability? The trouble with a lot of the way people talk about scale is it's the 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 idea is you take it away from the grassroots you institutionalize it you make it top down and that's the only way to make it legit and that is an idea that is fundamentally anti-democratic small d um we would argue and it's a big part of why people in lots of communities certainly in east kentucky feel like they're being sort of administered down to and 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 condescended to um and um so i think we always try to question this notion of what do you mean by scale if what you mean is you take what we did you bottle it you turn it into an algorithm um and you just like xerox it you know from a central administration on to other communities um then no it's impossible you can't do it um it's you got to build relationships you got to co-create it you've got to figure out what's going on um in a given community who they've got what they're looking to do um and that's you just you you, you cannot reproduce it as as an algorithm what you can do, and that's what Paula is, was just speaking to with some of these other efforts and 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 the links between them, um, and what some of the, the resources I put in the chat, what you can do is build grassroots to grassroots coalitions, right? Make it possible for local work in one place to meet local work in another place to meet local work in other places, and eventually build dialogue that is across ordinary people in lots and lots of different places. And that is what we are really interested in, both with Hands Across the Hills specifically and with the other projects that Hands Across the Hills people are involved with in different ways. And so that's the way that I would encourage people to think about, to think about this question of scale. Good, I'm gonna piggyback on that with another question that was asked. I agree with Ben on all of that. Somebody in your group is either Bosnian or has worked in Bosnia or lived in Bosnia. Somebody asked the question about Bosnia saying that the civil society level may work well, but what about the governments? What about where the power is? And of course that's been a challenge for me since I got into this work 40 years ago is how to reach those in power. And in most cases overseas, I've worked with civil society groups, sometimes grassroots, sometimes educator groups or clergy groups or you know, specific um, um, occupational groups, but not much with politicians. And finally in Nepal, we got a contract to work with politicians. They were tougher than civil society. They were, they were able to do less, produce less, concentrate less than civil society groups. And that was a real learning for us. Um, we, we know that change happens at institutional and structural levels and not just individual levels. And we hope by doing extensive civil society work to be able to reach governments. And oftentimes that happens because people know people and, and movements build and the dialogue movement now in this country um, attracts government people, they know about it. We've, several of us have been involved in writing position papers for the Biden administration and trying to keep moving forward the need to deal with polarizations in this kind of way. Dialogue is by nature small. It's what Ben was saying. It's a small, intimate uh, program and there can be lots and lots of them, but one dialogue program can't scale up to become hundreds of people. This ceases to be dialogical and becomes just more more of a mass educational movement and so over time I'm sorry. Here or in bosnia or wherever it is um 
our work is generally civil society, but we're very interested in transforming institutions. We work with educational institutions, religious institutions, all kinds in an attempt to get institutional change, which matters tremendously. Sorry, Ben. No, you're fine. Just real quickly, just to add to what you said, Paula, through the ongoing relationship um, work and connected to the organizing work was talking about, we have had people in Hands Across the Hills work together to share skills that's led to members of our group becoming board chairs of influential nonprofits. We had um, a couple of candidacies, actually people talking about running for office um, coming out of uh, the Kentucky group coming home. None of those things worked, but one force and actually the person who's talking about uh, hitting the other guy in the dialogue, she came a few votes short of, of uh, winning a, a, a mayoral election um, in, the t in the city that she lives in, in East Kentucky. Um, we are so providing, we, we have brokered relationships with various corporations um, that are using, that, 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 that are purchasing from local people in Letcher County in different ways. And so the work has gone into the material um, and it's definitely plenty more to do. Um, but we have, we, we yeah, it, 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 it's not just, it's not just talking. And I think that's really important. I was the person who asked the question about scalability, and I think was what I meant. Um, I wasn't, I think, clear uh, about what I meant by scalability, and it wasn't something like an algorithm or something that was institutionalized. It really had more to do with the kind of time commitments, the expertise that both of you have the challenges involved in facilitating difficult conversations. And what I was scratching my head about was, how does that get communicated to others uh, and others trained in order to make this process larger? And by larger, I don't mean by 100 people or 200 people, but these groups like you uh, were involved in uh, in different areas. So that's what I meant by scalability from the standpoint more of there's time commitments, there's expertise involved here, there's deep training, I would imagine. You know, I've been, I've facilitated groups and I know the challenges that are involved in that. Right after the Kentucky people came to Massachusetts, I began getting quite requests for training. So I ran, um, sessions for 60 people in our community who all wanted to learn about dialogue. And I did then six weeks, six weeks for one group, six weeks for the next group of, of a daily, what, once a week training. So I got a bunch of people trained who have then gone out in our region and done it. And I also, in my academic teaching, have trained people in dialogue from all over the country and world. So I'm doing as much as I can. There are courses and workshops available on many, many websites online. So many people can also learn about dialogue from going and paying attention to those websites. Dialogue is learned. It's not a necessarily a natural skill. It's not something we're born with, um, but it can be learned. And if you're interested in more training, again, there are resources on our website to help. A thing I wanna to add to that, um, Jim, we were talking before in the chat, a few of us talking about the Industrial Areas Foundation tradition, the notion of relational organizing. One of the basic tenets of that work is that every community has got leaders already. And by that, we don't mean people with official titles. We mean people who their neighbors look to in order to have guidance, in order to, to come together. So there are people in every community that are looking to make change, that are looking to bring people together, that are looking to have the hard conversations. That's one thing. Another thing I learned, honestly, going to Kentucky is, you know, any problem that you can point to a community and say um, that that community has got a problem, I guarantee you there are people in that community that have been working on that problem for a long time. Um, and it's one of the problems with the way I think national media reports on places like East Kentucky um, is that that's not part of it. And so it's not that, I mean, as, as Paula said, there's, there's training, there's skill building. You know, we've both invested a lot of time in training people and in making it possible for people to get connected to other resources to get trained, but we are not starting from nothing. It is not like, you know, 
that the, these people are there that want to do this, that want to put in the time, that have been building skills and doing this in their own ways for a long, long time. Um, and so key to this work is to find them. Key to this work is to find them, build relationships with them, help them get resources, um, help them connect to one another, because that's the way that the work grows. Barbara. I was curious what the group has said and uh, about the fact that um, so many of us seem to have a different view of truth and reality because we read different things, we see different things, we listen to different things, and you're now starting to see lots being written about that. But I'm really curious how, uh, I remember Gwen saying in one of the videos that I watched that, uh, you know, they really take what many of us would consider reliable news sources with a very large dose of salt. And I'm wondering what your conversations in the group have elicited in terms of what people have said about how they rely on information and how you communicate when you have very different beliefs and opinions of what's quote unquote true because of what you read and hear and rely on. That's a big, that's a big problem nationally and internationally. Um, media and social media is, um, is something that people are talking about all the time because of the incitement of violence and uh, distortions of truth going on. In terms of our group, our media is very different. When we went to Kentucky, I discovered that Fox News was on 24 seven. It was on in restaurants and bars and shops and homes and every place, cars, every place I went, and that's their media. And in our region, um, the media is maybe the New York Times or CNN or NPR. So it's very different media. There was a psychology professor who did an experiment with his class and he asked his students, um, if you are a um, liberal progressive person for the next month, watch only Fox News. And he asked the um, conservative person, um, would you watch only uh, CNN for the next month? After three days, students came back and said, I'm going to quit the class. I can't bear it. The cognitive dissonance was so intense. He had to stop the experiments. Nobody would do it. They, the onslaught of what people understood as untruth on both sides made it impossible to continue the work. And that tells us how impactful the media is. And layer on top of that, the social media, which we know is designed and targeted to reach very specific audiences. And you have what in other times we call brainwashing. You know, which people's minds are just filled with every day with things that they disagree with on the other side. And, you know, I get up in the morning and I read the Times online every day and I think, I wish I could send my Kentucky friends this article and this article and this opinion piece, this editorial, and I don't because I can't proselytize to them and I don't want Fox News sent to me every morning. So I understand that. We could make that happen, Paula. It, I don't <laughs> want that to happen. We got to off my computer. You want to get me off my computer? That's a way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that um, I think that one of the things that we all have to contend with now is media is distorting our realities, and instead of pulling us together and binding us, it's breaking us, and it's very dangerous and very serious. So now the $64,000 question, do you have any suggestions for, I mean, seriously, you know, both sides are being damaged by this and but what the heck can you do? I mean, none of us can control the media. So any ideas for how we get out of this box? I have a so, very close colleague who's doing this work all around the world. She's surveying social media in every, on every continent and discovering us the same problem everywhere, creating additional divisions. On, Let man. me say also, so we had a dialogue just this past week and we were it was we hadn't talked for a while it was sort of more general and catch up and this discussion came up very um significantly so actually the next dialogue that we're going to have over zoom um in the next month is going to be specifically on this question and we're going to start so, so 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 the the i think the most concrete suggestion that i can offer and that we're doing is pose this as a problem for the group to work on together and so the question of where do we get information how do we evaluate what's true and what's not true how do we 
recognize the ways in which media um, are dividing us um, and what can we together better understand about it. And so part of that is, so again, part of it is posing that as a common question to work on. Um, and then the second is sharing stories. So, you know, I immediately, um, we, you know, with my biases, I came to East Kentucky and I'm thinking, well, well, you all are just ignorant. You just think that it's all fake because you don't agree with it. And then I started looking at the hundred year history of all of the lies that the national media have told about East Kentucky and the people that live there and that have been incredibly damaging, not just because they hurt people's feelings, but because they literally enable and legitimize economic exploitation. Well, these people are dumb. And so clearly we can come in and just treat them like shit because they've never known any better. Right. Well, these people are ignorant, so we can come in and just we, 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 we can just dismiss their perspectives and just administer to them. And it doesn't matter what they think about their communities because they're ignorant. So why should we pay attention to them? These things have had real, real world impact for 100 years. Um, and even just recently, the CBS special on, on Hands Across the Hills a few weeks ago, they flat out said that everybody in East Kentucky voted for Trump. It's not true. First of all, in Letcher County, it was 80% voted for Trump. So 20% 20 did, 20 didn't. But more importantly, in 2016, at least, I haven't seen all the stats for, from 2020 yet, only 35% of registered voters even showed up to vote at all. And so these are lies. There's no other way to say it than these are lies. Does that mean that I believe that the media is all bullshit and we can't trust anything in the New York Times? No, of course I don't believe that. But I do believe that every New York Times story I've ever read about people in East Kentucky that I know has not been entirely accurate um, and has included things that I would consider lies. And so again, part of it is sharing stories and coming to understand where the other person is coming from and then coming together and say, what can we do together to address this thing that is hurting all of us? And that's the active work that Hands Across the Hills is doing right now. Kat, can you join in? As I put in the chat, I'm a, I'm a Yankee. I was born in New York, grew up in Jersey, and I've lived in Vermont. And I lived in Charleston right before I came to California again um, for seven years. And I did racial equity, racial justice work and cross-racial coalitions when I was in Charleston, South Carolina. So I know very well that the South has a long history of anti-racist work that is cross-racial. And in fact, my experience is that work was much more deep than I ever experienced in the Northeast. <laughs> um, and one of the big lies I heard was that um, racism is a Southern thing, mm -hmm. which I'll just leave there. I won't get into how wrong that is. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm curious about right now is how, when I sometimes, when I say things like this, um, people, you know, when they hear me defending things in the South, or when I encourage people not to call people, I'm a lefty, right? So mm -hmm. when I hear people, um, when I try to encourage people not to call people on the right idiots and don't mm -hmm. do that, and people then attack me mm -hmm. and accuse me of defending things that I don't believe in and that I oppose, but they, they it's so all or nothing. And I've found it to be harder to talk to people on the left about dialogue than people on the right. And so I'm echoing what you said, Ben, but it's also, I'm, I'm generalizing here, um, but, but I'm ex I experienced a lot more really vicious attacks from particularly other white liberals who used self-righteousness as a weapon. So I'd love to hear your thoughts um, about that. And I'm speaking just from my experience, so I, I don't wanna sound like I'm globalizing everything I'm saying, but I'd love to hear your, your thoughts about this. Well, I, I don't think that anybody has a monopoly on self-righteousness. <laughs> I think it goes around, around, all around everywhere. Everybody's got it. Everyone has something to defend and some identity to defend, political identity, personal identity, and, and people get righteous when they're defending identities. And I think that ch the challenge for all of us is to, is to, um, to cut through that so that you're getting to something a little more wholesome between people than, than an identity competition. And 
you know, if people feel like I'm defending Kentuckians, um, I want to talk to them about it. So I would develop dialogue questions, even for a little two person conversation, you know, what, what makes you feel that way? And, and what's the impact of that on you? And, you know, questions that will help people help me understand um, their anger at me, because they probably feel like I'm betraying them or you're betraying them because you're supporting other people. And exactly. You know, exactly. To get it so that people understand you're not betraying anybody. You're trying to open the conversation and help us look at ourselves. I twice voted for a presidential candidate who sold out the labor movement, deported countless numbers of undocumented immigrants, and killed people extrajudicially around the world through drone strikes. His name is Barack Obama. The idea, if I am going to dehumanize you because of your vote, then you get to dehumanize me because of my vote. And soon there's not going to be very many humans left in the world. Um, and so, you know, part of it is you can't work with everybody, right? That people are going to come at this in different ways. Um, and you've got to, you know, some people, and this is similar to your question um, in the chat before, Kat, about the question of bipartisanship. You can't be bipartisan if the person on the other side is going to be a cynic, right? Mitch McConnell is not going to work in good faith. I just don't believe it. And as Paula said, some of our most right-wing people in East Kentucky are just as pissed at Mitch McConnell as we are. Um, and so you got to be working with people that are working in good faith. Not everybody can do it, and not everybody can do it now. Some people are just too consumed with their anger and with their... Um, you know, just feelings of just overwhelmedness. And that doesn't, that doesn't make them bad people. That doesn't make them, you know, bigots or intolerant or whatever. It's just, they're not there right now. And so, um, you know, you, but among the people that are, are there, you know, again, I just, the, you don't get anything by dehumanizing people. You just don't. Um, if we don't affirm people where they're at, they are not going to change because we're not going to ever have a relationship with them strong enough where they can. And not everybody's going to believe that, and that's okay. But that's that's my deep conviction from lots of experience, um, and I just sit in that. And if you want to see a larger dialogue, um, we videoed a mini dialogue with myself facilitating three Kentuckians and three Massachusetts people, and that's also newly on the website and available. It's an hour. And it really gives you a sense of how this community has built over time. So you can check it out. 